Hi, I'm Jeff Goodman and welcome to scubaverse.com. Today I'm talking with Paul Watson, founder of the Sea Shepherd Conservation Society. When you do things or set out on a campaign or you achieve things, um, it's quite important how all that's reported, of course, to the general public. Do you find things like that are reported accurately or is there a lot of misinformation that goes out in TV press? Well, of course, then that depends on, on the networks. Uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of... Um, uh, a lot of points of view that are uh, that are injected into these stories, uh, depending on which media you're you're dealing with. So some media is hostile and, and some is not, uh, and some is more objective than, than others. I mean, if you're dealing with a Fox network in the United States, forget it. You know, you're not going to get any uh, truth out of that. So I actually I found that the best way is really to uh, control our own narrative and through the documentaries and you know, for instance, our own show on on uh, Whale Wars on Animal Planet. And uh, it was an interesting thing we did with Whale Wars because with Animal Planet, uh, I think it was probably the, the most authentic reality show because they had no say in what we did or how we did it. And we had no say in how they edited it. So they simply ran the cameras and edited it and we did what we did. So um, everything that was happening there was completely unscripted. Um, and, and of course, the only problem with it, the only complaint I have is because they didn't have access to the Japanese vessels, even though they did ask Japan to do so, they seem to sometime go over the top and trying to make, uh, make us look bad in order to appear to be objective. But overall, I think it went out quite well. Uh, what do you think the future holds for us all now, Paul? In global terms, in the environment and uh, marine world especially? Well, uh, yesterday, uh, President Donald Trump uh, was at a meeting in California when uh, he was, they were talking about the effects of climate change on, on, the, board, on the fires. And he said that uh, he didn't think that that was a factor at all. And they said, well, you know, the science is, is such and such. And he said, well, it, it's going to get cooler. And they said, well, what, what science do you have behind that? And he said, science is wrong. You know, and so with this kind of leadership, <laughs> the future doesn't look very, very promising. Um, so, I mean, also today, in today's news, uh, you know, two of Antarctica's uh, major ice shelves are on the verge of collapse. Uh, these fires are at 50% more intensity than ever before. There's five hurricanes right now today circulating in the Atlantic. In fact, they're starting to, they're going to be running out of names uh, in the alphabet for, the, for, for, the, uh, for these hurricanes. I think they're up to W now. Uh, so it's right there in front of us as to what's happening, but there's so much denial and that denial is based on self-interest, uh, political and economic self-interest. And, uh, so where's that going? I have no idea. Um, you know, a lesson I learned a long time ago though, is that you focus on the present and that will define the future. So I don't really worry about the future. Um, we just have to do it the best we can right now and see if that has any impact at all. No, that's perfect philosophy. Yeah, do it today. Do it today, absolutely. If people want to, because um, a lot of people just are so busy leading their own lives, that they, they find it difficult to get involved in conservation projects of any sort. Uh, if people want to help out, no matter how small it is, what, what's the best things they can do? I think that people just simply need to be aware of the impact in their everyday life of what they do, what they eat, uh, what, you know, what the energy they consume uh, and that and try and make as minimal impact as, uh, as possible. And, uh, but it is difficult. I mean, there's a uh, 8 billion soon to be maybe nine, soon to be 10 billion of us. And, uh, the, the planet just doesn't have the carrying capacity for those kind of numbers, uh, especially for uh, meat-eating primates, <laughs> you know. Uh, so 
we ha we're going to have to have some significant changes if we're going to survive. The one thing that I think that we really need to address is what we're doing to the ocean. The ocean is the life support system of the planet. And as I say all over and over again, if the ocean dies, well, we all die. I mean, phytoplankton provides 70% of the oxygen that we breathe. And uh, we're destroying the oceans and we're overfishing the oceans. And uh, according to Dr. Boris Worm or Dr. Daniel Pauly, the two foremost fishery biologists in the world today, by 2048, there won't be any fishing industry because there won't be any fish. So what I've been advocating is that we need a, a, at least a 50 year moratorium on all heavy gear commercial fishing operations, industrialized fishing, it has to be shut down. And uh, people say, well, what about the jobs? Well, what about the jobs 50 years from now when there won't be any jobs, <laughs> you know? So that's what's, that's called conservation in order to, uh, you know, to, to uh, uh, foresee the future. But uh, I don't see any indication that that's happening. There's about 40% of all of the, uh, the, the fishing operations in the world today are illegal. And just, just to shut them down is almost uh, an impossible task. And uh, so where do we begin on that? But uh, one of the things that we can do is to stop all government subsidies to the fishing industry because basically they, they exist primarily by those subsidies. And when you look at the economics of it, for instance, um, your average industrialized trawler, though, goes for 100 million plus to build. That's a lot of fish to catch just to pay back the banks for the loans and the interest in that. And so they're caught in this vicious circle of having to take more and more to pay back all these incredible debts. It's, it's really the economics of extinction. And, uh, and of course, that also leads into the fact where, for instance, there are people are actually investing in the ex extinction of species. Like the bluefin tuna is a good example. I mean, we're down, we've removed 90% of them, but the fishery still goes. And the, the price of a bluefin tuna is incredible, is astronomical. I mean, the average $75,000 per fish in Japan. And, uh, but here's, uh, but they could shut it down. They could stop it tomorrow because Mitsubishi alone has a 10 to 15 year supply in their warehouses of bluefin tuna. So they could continue to provide the market and allow the fish to recover. But here's why they won't do it. Because if the fish begin to recover, the price of the fish will go down. And therefore, the price of their, uh, the fish in their warehouses will go down. And they want to keep that price up. So scarcity translates into, uh, into those high prices. And if, if they go extinct, well, they're sitting on 10, 10 years of supply, which they can set their own price for. And these companies aren't really into fishing. Mitsubishi's never started out as fishing. They'll just take the, that short-term profit from their short-term investment and invest it in other, other things. And so that, that kind of economics is what's driving all this towards, uh, you know, the extinction of the fishes in the ocean. And, and of course, all of this is driven by consumers. We buy it. Yeah, we buy it and we don't even think about it. And uh, for instance, uh, <clears throat> Uh, again, it's about 30, 35% of all of the, um, the fish taken from the ocean isn't even eaten by people. It's uh, fed to, uh, to animals like uh, uh, pigs and chickens and uh, cats. Chickens are eating more fish than all the world's albatrosses put together. And domestic house cats are eating more fish than all the seals in the North Atlantic Ocean. You know, 2.8 million tons of fish go for cat food every year. And hardly a natural food for a cat. If a, if a, if a yellowfin tuna ever met a cat, would probably eat the cat. So, uh, you know, but people are oblivious to all of this. We don't see it because uh, we're all insulated, alienated from the, the reality of what we're doing to, uh, to the natural world. Yeah. Paul, thank you. Thank you for that. It's been great seeing you again. And thank you for all of what you just said. Um, what's the next um, campaign? Are you actually going out on any campaigns now? I haven't been because, you know, I'm still uh, battling Japan over an Interpol red note. But, uh, you know, the Interpol, the Interpol red notice was set up to stop serial killers, war criminals, and major drug traffickers. I'm the only person in history to be put on that list for conspiracy to trespass on a whaling ship, a whaling ship which was operating illegally. I didn't even do it, but you know, the charge of conspiracy. <laughs> but Japan's a powerful nation and they were able to get me on that list. But uh, I am, uh, we're, we're fighting Interpol right now to have it removed because uh, you know, it's really an abuse of uh, the Interpol operation, which ironically is the same Interpol that we're working with on a day-to-day -day basis to stop illegal fishing. So it's all very, uh, very complex. But uh, but I am, but I am consulting with uh, you know the operations of the ships uh, 
worldwide. And uh, we've got numerous captains, numerous officers. I think uh, right now about 150 crew on are out there on those ships right now. Uh, we've been a little restricted because of the COVID pandemic. Uh, our vessel, the Ocean Warrior, has been stuck in uh, Singapore and Hopefully, we'll be able to get it out at the end of September. But the crew haven't been able to get off that ship since February. Uh, they can't even go ashore. So, you know, that, that, hit that hit that one vessel quite hard. And we're just finally getting our vesicle, vessels back out on the water to protect the Paquita in, uh, in the Sea of Cortez. So uh, we, we've had to deal with that. And, of course, it's a little more difficult because every time we go to sea, we have to quarantine the crews for a couple of weeks prior to uh, get boarding the vessels. But we still we have a crew this year in uh, in the Faroes. Every you know, we're still going. Uh, this year we took a different tactic. The crew are all Danes, so uh, that's no. Uh, they haven't killed any uh, whales since August first, and I think uh, we took them off guard putting an all Danish crew on there because they're you know they're communicating to Denmark and uh, and uh, so this and we've been trying to get Denmark to to take action on this for some for some time. That's. Remarkable. That's that's really good. Crikey. Yeah, we actually have supporters in the Pharaohs now, which is right. you know is different, of course. But, but you have uh, people this... visiting the islands for Sea Shepherd. It's not just a standoff uh, offshore. Did you have actually people? Well, we, had, we, actually had, we had our ships there in 2011. I went back in 2011, and uh, and uh, but then they, by 2013, they banned our ships. Our ship, no, no Sea Shepherd ship can come into Faroese water. And then we've had people there disrupting the whole thing from the shore. And then they banned anybody who's a member of Sea Shepherd or who's wearing a Sea Shepherd shirt or anything, you know, <laughs> banned that. Well, yeah. uh, one of the funnier campaigns we did is that while our crew were there, you know, they have public washrooms. And so one, one, this one mayor decided that, uh, you know, Sea Shepherd people couldn't use the public washrooms. <laughs> and uh, he said that because it was a, a waste of, um, uh, of the toilet paper, that they were paying for the toilet paper and therefore <laughs> couldn't be using the toilet paper. So I organized a campaign for everybody to send rolls of toilet paper to the care. <laughs> and they got thousands of rolls of toilet paper in the mail, you know, saying, Size, this should take care of your toilet paper problem. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Fantastic. So uh, when's the next trip back up there? Oh, uh, well, they're there right now. Oh, they are. Uh, they're there right now. And uh, we did do a, a Whale Wars uh, thing uh, uh, there called uh, Whale Wars uh, Biking Shores, they called it. Uh, and that was an interesting one because 2011, they didn't kill any whales that summer at all. And here's their strategy, brilliant strategy on their part, which played right into our hands, which was if, if Whale Wars Discovery and Sea Shepherd are here, we're not going to kill any whales. Mm -hmm. And if we don't kill any whales, they're not going to have a TV show. <laughs> so they didn't kill any whales and we just used archive footage and said geez what a success we actually went up there and no whales were killed and that was the objective of us being there in the first place <laughs> uh, absolutely we're to treat yeah so that worked out really quite well <laughs> my goodness my goodness are you ever over over here in the uk uh well you know we, we have a sea ship for in the UK, but I, I, I probably won't be there for a while. I, uh, and in fact, well, I, I might be able to travel within the new year because uh, I got a letter from the U.S. Department of Commerce allowing me, or Department of Justice allowing me. My big concern was coming back to uh, the U.S. because uh, under this uh -huh. red I could have, and with the Trump administration, who knows, I could have been, I could be arrested and then extradited to Japan, even though I'm a U.S. citizen. As a, right. And Canada, Canada won't let me in, and I'm a Canadian citizen. They said they'll extradite me. But um, while I'm in the country, they can't do it. But if, when you come into the country, they can actually intercept you and do it. So it's a very complicated thing. But now I got this letter, and but I could, because I can go to France, no problem. I went there and you know had no problem with the French government. Uh, I don't know about the UK though. That's a problem. Yeah, Paul, thank you very much indeed. As I say, uh, great seeing you, and um, well, good luck to us all in the future. <laughs> thank you. Cheers, Paul. Bye. Thanks, Jeff.